workshop. And uh, uh, thanks to Mohamed Shinawi for being with us today. We are very pleased and honored that uh, he's uh, in Siena for a few days. And uh, yesterday we met the rector, and uh, we are also planning future activities. Today, the topic that we, he will uh, present is about science diplomacy in the Mediterranean area, the role of universities, obviously also related to what uh, uh, he and we are doing with Prima, and uh, we will discuss about it later. Now, just to start the day, we give the floor briefly to the delegate for the internationalization, Professor Simone Borghesi, to introduce the day, and then to uh, Professor Verzichelli, just to uh, highlight the link with his uh, pro master program. Simone. Thank you, Angelo, and thank you to Professor Eshinawi, because it's real pleasure and honor for us to have you here. I want to tell a, a little story, anecdote, about the organization of this event. When Angelo wrote me and uh, Giovanni wrote me, saying there is this event, I look at my agenda and say, well, no way I can make it. Then I look at the person and the title and say, okay, there is a way I can make it. <laughs> because I really wanted to, to be here today. And for us, in terms of University of Siena, it's really important what you're doing, what Prima is doing, and the Mediterranean link. Um, we invested a lot of efforts, and I have to say thanks to Andrew who started this with the SDS and MED, and uh, as a delegate uh, of the director for international relations, it's my intention to continue and possibly reinforce this trend. So that is why we are so happy to have you here today. That's all. Okay. Also, second is uh, uh, thanking, and I want to thank, of course, uh, the Prima team, uh, Angel Di Caboni. Uh, I want to thank uh, the uh, delegate of the director, uh, our guest, uh, uh, I had a little talk with him, and uh, uh, I think uh, we will have to uh, explore uh, possibilities of uh, cooperation, uh, particularly in the Mediterranean area, which is crucial for so many um, uh, sub-communities, let's say, of the, of, the, of the community of learners in Siena. And I have to thank the students, and particularly the students from the uh, Master in Public Culture and Diplomacy and the uh, Vocational Master in uh, uh, Conflict Management and Humanitarian Action, which is uh, um, very much focused on, on the Mediterranean. But these are only a few examples, and, and of course we have only a representation of students, many students, uh, they left Siena already uh, after the exams. Uh, but it's important to, to show that we are, uh, uh, you know, uh, trying to focus uh, uh, the problems uh, and the future of the Mediterranean uh, by different points of view and by different dis disciplinary perspectives. This is the effort we are, we are doing in Siena, and I have to, to say that Prima was a, a fantastic catalyst in, 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 in trying to get this uh, object. So thank you very much. <laughs> so before leaving the floor to our uh, guest, and we are very pleased that uh, Professor Shinao is here, just a few words on, on the context. Uh, yesterday I was uh, talking with uh, uh, Stefania Giannini, previous uh, Minister of uh, Education and Research and Education in Italy, and she was the main uh, engine for the uh, definition and the launch of Prima, <coughs> taking advantage of the Italian presidency of the European Council, it was uh, 2015. And uh, at that time, uh, it was uh, clear that uh, uh, we needed uh, some more cooperation among the two shores of the Mediterranean, and uh, it was very difficult to make uh, researchers talk to each other. So the idea was to use uh, agri-food system as, a, as an area to, to create uh, relationships, to build bridges and not walls. And that was uh, really something that uh, Italy push a lot, especially Minister Giannini. And at the end of the story, after a very long uh, uh, track, a long journey, we were able to, to launch it in 2017. And one of the, of the key issues, uh, of our key features of Prima is that it is based on the principle of equal footing. 
Equal footing is really our backbone. Equal footing means that we must, we have to decide everything together, we have to manage the, the, the program together, make decisions together. In order to do that, you need to create trust. Without trust, it is impossible to, to work together. So I would like to thank uh, Mohamed because in the past five years, we worked together as coaches of Prima, and I really, uh, I'm really pleased that uh, we work very well, but uh, I really admire his uh, vision and also his uh, capacity to work together to create liaisons with a, a very difficult environment like uh, all the South Mediterranean countries and to make a good relationship between uh, the South and the North. And uh, I think that uh, uh, it is a clear example that we can make it. We can work together, we can create bridges, uh, even when there is a very competitive, uh, very, there are very competitive tasks such as doing research, which is a very competitive environment. Uh, we were able to reach interesting achievements and uh, uh, one minute advert for Prima. Here we have copies of the uh, judgment of the valuation by a third party consultant who was hired by the commission to evaluate Prima. And what we say always that if we would have written it, it wouldn't have been so nice because uh, it is really uh, with nice words about Prima saying that it is a clear example, is a benchmark for scientific diplomacy. We were able to foster South-South and South-North cooperation. So uh, really, really pleased of it. But if we made it, it's because of the cooperation among countries, especially with Egypt and, and uh, Mohammed, with the efforts of all the, all the participants, all the members, there are 19 uh, uh, members, as uh, Mohammed will see later, the commission was uh, really supporting us, but also at home we had a uh, nice support in Italy, uh, mainly by the Ministry of uh, University of Research, MUR, before it was uh, MUR, but also locally, thanks to the contribution of uh, each university. So I take this opportunity to thank uh, Francesco, well, uh, he was a rector, Francesco Fred was really supporting the advancement of Prima, and now also Roberto Di Pietra is really supporting our work. So, in order to achieve uh, targets, you need uh, really a team, you need uh, an effort which is uh, very large, and uh, these uh, contributions, the contributions of uh, single universities, uh, single countries, uh, single national funding agencies, single ministries is so important. And also locally, uh, we'd like to take a few words just to thank uh, Giovanni Strangellini and Cristiana Tozzi and all the staff of, uh, of the uh, Santa Chiara Lab, Fiorino di Antonio, because certainly in these years, uh, uh, the, 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 this very new uh, thing, which was the Italian Secretariat of Prima, because it's the only country with a, a national secretariat, the Italian Secretariat was very important in order to promote the participation of Italian researchers to Prima. And as a matter of fact, we are the country with the highest number of uh, coordination, highest number of participants, and uh, fund received by the program. So this is also because the Secretariat is working very well, so I would like to thank uh, all the people here of the staff. And we need, uh, to, uh, please join me with applause to these people. They have been doing really a great job, so thank you very much. Now the mic to my dear friend Mohamed. Uh, he is first of all coach of Prima, but he's also <laughs> director of the University of Galala. He will explain uh, what the Galala is, but it's a very interesting uh, initiative, uh, brand new almost, and uh, in a very few years, Mohamed was able to bring uh, this uh, university to very great success. So, and also he's advisor of many institutions, and, uh, and uh, he's a key role within the Egyptian uh, ecosystem innovation of innovation. So. Thank you for being here. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. I would like to start. You can hear me now. Uh, my voice is Buongiorno, Sabah khair in Arabic, and good morning. And Mayo Plazeri is a Seri Ki Asian. Finally, I'm speaking Italian. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew. And it's a pleasure and honor to be here. I've been working with Andrew for than 10 years, and I think seeing what's happening in Prima uh, is a flagship in not only in the region, but in the cooperation and in the scientific diplomacy all over, not only in the Mediterranean, but I think worldwide, and maybe
many studies have been done on FEMA, and I'll talk a lot about that. But what makes my day, really, to see this young generation in front of me, thank you so much for being here. You are the future. What, all what we are doing is for you. And this is exactly what we hope that you will continue, but not on the same level, but much more better than what we are doing. I will not talk a lot, because we will need more of discussion, and to hear your views and your questions, and what you want to say, and to hear your voice, this is very important. This is my disclaimer, I don't know any commercial association that might pose a conflict of interest, so that NGO will not charge me for any after I finish this lecture. This is a very overview about what I'm talking today. I'll be talking about what is the concept of science diplomacy. What is science diplomacy? We heard a lot before, you know, you remember the score diplomacy, when you see the ping pong diplomacy, things like that, but now there is the aspect of science diplomacy. Challenges around our region, the Mediterranean. If you go around the Mediterranean, if you are in Siena or if you are in Sicily, and then you move to Alexandria, in Egypt, and then you go to Barcelona, you feel the smell of the Mediterranean. And you see the culture of the Mediterranean. There is this link within all the Mediterranean countries. Then Prima, of course, some of the rules of the Italian and Egyptian University in Science Diplomacy, and allow me to talk about my university, that I'm proud to be the president, then a conclusion. So, I think... Sure. This? The, this one? Okay. So, is it okay, like, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's the director, so <laughs> all the technologies is according to him. So, uh, when we talk about science diplomacy, what is science diplomacy? I think we see all the challenges that we are facing worldwide. And climate change and all the challenges that we are facing with the climate change, uh, the migration, the food system, the agri-food system, water scarcity. I'm a physician, I'm a surgeon by background, there's a lot of challenges. I think we saw the COVID-19 and how all the world without science diplomacy and working together wouldn't fight this. So science diplomacy now is an emerging thing that we have to work on, have put some rules and see how we can support it. Because I think we have all common problems that facing humanities. But there are different forms of science diplomacy. There is science in diplomacy, where we are informing for us foreign policy to scientific advice, diplomacy for science to facilitate the science and having the cooperation between countries. And there is science for diplomacy that we are going to stress on in our uh, discussions today. I think we have these scientific values all over the continents and among universities, especially in our ecosystem. And we see how science provides a non-ideological environment for the participation and free exchange of ideas between people, regardless of cultural, nation, nationality, or religious background. And this is the core of science diplomacy. There, is, there are no borders between our countries and no borders between scientists. You know, when a scientist gets an idea, He's just focused how I'm going to reach. He has a hypothesis. He wants to achieve this hypothesis, and that's how he is using all the tools in order to reach this. And that's why you will find around the Mediterranean many organizations are trying to bring together universities. Union for Mediterranean University. There is a community of Mediterranean University. Imoni University has a, a network of more than 140 universities around the Mediterranean. That's why the range of actors involved in this are a lot. And there are a lot of players that we have to cooperate together in order to achieve what we need as regard our communities and the prosperous and the healthy communities that we are looking for. Our region. I'm coming from this region. Egypt is a young country, only 7,000 years old. I'm here in Italy. so. We are the history. The history came from this region. You are talking about 22 countries, around 500 million population, 
with more than 46,000 coastline with all with three continents where culture, heritage, a lot of trade is around the Mediterranean. This is the area where the major global imbalance are very obvious. And I will show you one of the reports that came from here and shows the challenge that we are facing in our region. Environmental, social, economic, it's a place that needs a lot of uh, activities, a lot of efforts in order to improve our uh, ecosystem. And I think this is the role of universities and the science diplomacy you are talking about. Around the Mediterranean, there is around 1,000 universities. In Egypt, a country like Egypt with a 110 million population, 2014, we had 54 universities. Now, Egypt is more than 95 universities. In less than seven years, Egypt added to its university system not less than 40 universities. What is the reason for that? The country put a vision, Egypt Vision 2030, and one of the main pillars was scientific research and higher education system. In our system, there is around 3.5 million students, more than 130,000 professors. You see the power? This is only one of the countries around the Mediterranean. So that's why it's very important to build on these universities. In Italy, this is what I saw in the internet, maybe it's, I don't know, it's around 100 universities in the country, one of the strongest high ranking, although yeah, we have our concerns about the ranking, but most of our universities in our region has a very high ranking, and that's why building cooperation within our universities is very crucial. Also, very important thing is the international students. Yesterday when I was with Professor Riccaboni and uh, University of Siena rector, and by the way, I'm honored that two previous rectors are attending my lecture, Two already of those who are in the uh, management are attending, so thank you for being with me today. So this shows the international students. In Siena University, around 10% of the students are international students. Egypt studied, started a very important initiative called Study in Egypt. We already have in the country around 100,000 100, international students coming mostly from Africa and the Middle East. Our aim is to reach 500,000, half a million students. This is a source, a th sort of science diplomacy to bring people around the world to come and study, have this cultural exchange. This is very crucial and very important. Yes, just imagine any challenge. Just mention one challenge, you'll find it in our region. Agrobiodiversity, lack of innovation, we have a lot of uh, Conflict as regards the innovation, water scarcity, population growth, climate change, migration, employment, blah, 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 a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of challenges in our region. So, 2012 was a key time when the countries around the Mediterranean thought we have to, to walk and see something to do. And then came 2017 where Prima comes. Prima, I think all of you knows about Prima, I will not talk about Prima, but the two co-chairs are sitting, but we have to talk about Prima from another perspective. Partnership for Research and Innovation in the Mediterranean area. For those, in very short wording, what's Prima? Prima is a foundation that's founded through 19 countries around the Mediterranean and the European Commission based on a very important concept, equal footing. What's equal footing? We are together, co-decision, co-management, co-finance. Is it just written? No, it's actually practiced. How we are sitting as 19 countries around one table, talking, seeing what are the challenges, how we are putting our annual work plan, how we are cooperating together. This is very crucial and very important. Long-term commitment to avoid fragmentation, focusing on not only research, 
but how to move from research innovation action to innovation action, how to move to have a real product, to see a product on ground, to link between universities and the industry, and to make the diplomacy around the Mediterranean. This is what exactly Prima is not about, that we are talking about, yeah, we are funding 200 projects around the Mediterranean, no. It's building the networking, building the bridges between different actors and players. Universities, stakeholders as uh, private companies, other centers, all of this is very crucial. But what you know was more important is the alignment of research and innovation agenda around the Mediterranean. This alignment is very crucial because when you are talking about science diplomacy and you are talking about the role of universities, it's not only a professor coming from this university to this university, no. He's bringing the know-how. He's bringing a lot of scientific hypotheses. He's bringing the administrative part, the logistics part. All of these things are very important. Alignment between our countries is very crucial to help in supporting research and getting an outcome. Always, when you are doing your work, remember that we need in our communities more of a high TRL in our products, technology readiness level of our projects. I'll give you an example of, of Egypt. Egypt now is number one in publications around Africa and one of the best 26 countries worldwide. We are producing 33,000 scientific publications every year. But what we are missing is to transfer or translate these publications into a product to see an effect on our communities. The patencies that are coming out of the country is not yet proportional with the number of publications. And this here comes the role of one of of Prima as an initiative, as an example of that, and I'll be talking about that also. Critical mass of actors and resources, and I'll show you some very interesting numbers about the participation of universities in Prima and strengthening the capacities of research and innovation capacities. It's changing ideas, changing people, moving around, having uh, people talking together and scientists, this is very important. So, all of this within a vision and a mission to see an inclusive, healthy, and prosperous Mediterranean, especially in the agri-food and water system, and to promote integration and alignment and joint implementation of research and innovation. Under what? A common strategy. Under a common strategy. This is very important. We always, there is a proverb that says, culture, culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If you didn't adapt your strategy according to the culture we are working within, you can put the best strategy ever worldwide, but the culture that we are living in will always defeat this strategy. For instance, if we started this lecture at 7 a.m. in Egypt, no one will attend. But according to the culture of Egyptians and as Mediterraneans, we usually start at 10, and like at 10, the people are 10. While in the United States, when I'm giving a lecture, it's at 7 a.m. This is the culture. So we have to respect the culture within our region. So, Prima, with 500 million, 500 million euros, management of water, farming, agri-food system. This is very interesting. Until now, Prima has supported 202 projects around the Mediterranean, with nearly 2,000 beneficiaries, with around 265 million euros. What's more interesting that you'll find that more than 25% of the beneficiaries are universities around the Mediterranean, around 463 universities, which represents nearly 50% of the universities in the region are within the networking of this is amazing. All the networking I showed you before, the maximum was 140. Prima actually is double the number of universities and playing a lot of science diplomacy around the region. And this is the role of universities that we have to stress on. If we concentrate more, Egypt, 
We have 88 beneficiaries, nearly 20% of those are universities with around 11.6 million uh, euros with 69 projects. Italy, 159 projects, nearly 30% of the beneficiaries are universities with around 64.8 million euros with a success rate of 9.2. So you see how important Prima is for the universities around the region. But are we only looking for publications? No. We are really looking for a real impact. And this is the role of us as co-chairs of this very important initiative. Increasing production and efficiency, political stability, and reduce of migration, biodiversity, and sustainability. We always think about sustainability. It's very important. How are we going to have a sustainable product out of our projects? And this is happening within universities, building cooperation together, but not only that, building this trust between the universities and other stakeholders with the political institutes and political leaders. The political, uh, I would say, those are taking the decision, decision makers, building trust and with the industry. One of the defects we see in our region is the trust between the scientific community and the business, the scientific community and the industry. This is very important to build this bridge between universities and other major players in the region. Angelo was just talking about the interim evaluation, and I will always echo what he said. Both of us wrote this in terms of evaluation with it written as good as it is written. I concentrated only, got very good news, that Prima will not stop at 2028, but there are a lot of talks that there's extension for this very important flagship uh, foundation around the Mediterranean. Some of the reports, the use of science for foreign policy purposes to address social needs in the Mediterranean and specific objectives that address advances towards an integrated European and Mediterranean research to science diplomacy goals for the collaboration with the EU thousand neighbors. The program can be considered a relevant tool of science diplomacy that helps bring closer the EU and its Mediterranean neighborhood. At the same time, the partnership greatly contributes to strengthening the relation and the collaboration between the EU and its thousand neighbors. Any progress towards higher political stability and sustainability development of the South Mediterranean has positive political effect in the EU. So all of these were quotes that I took from this interim evaluation. And this is one of the tools for science diplomacy and the role of universities in the region. Let me read for you part of the conclusion, and allow me that I always do, I don't like to read from the slides, but here I really want to, write, to read it word by word. The partnership addresses environmental, socio-economic, and policy challenges that are crucial to the future development of a more circular and more sustainable Mediterranean region. Prima contributes to key EU political priorities, objectives, and initiatives such as the European Green Deal and others. It contributes to strengthening the relation and the collaboration between the EU and its southern Mediterranean countries. And all of those, you can imagine that 25% of the beneficiaries are nearly 500 universities around this region. Building this network, this is very important, and we have to build on that. And these are some, I just, out of the 202 projects, I wouldn't have the time to talk about all of them, but these are some of the projects. I'm not talking about conflicts, but you will see the partners, and you can see how this is building between. One of the projects is land degradation, and you see how this, uh, desertification is one of the major threats, but you see the partners, you find Morocco, you find Spain, you find Turkey, you find Egypt, you find France, you find Netherlands, all of those are playing together within all these universities working together. Another project between 
state of Palestine, Greece, Jordan, Israel, all of those are in the same project working together in one of the projects that's called Eco Future. And Prima has a flagship within the Wafi Nexus. What's Wafi? It's water, uh, energy, food, ecosystem. And we are very happy and very thrilled that we were one of those who promoted the Wafi Nexus. Another project between Algeria, Morocco, Portugal, and Spain, working together, university in Algeria, university of Morocco, and working with the challenges of water within our region. So universities are real and playing a real role in science diplomacy, and not only science diplomacy, but actually the problems that we are facing in our region. We were present in the COP27, presenting what universities are doing in Prima. And this uh, presentation of Prima within the Mediterranean, within the COP27, that we were honored, it was in Sharm Sheikh in Egypt last November, and actually had a great time with Professor Riccaboni in, uh, in Egypt. So it showed how the Prima is playing a role in the climate change. But is it stop here? Is it only partnerships and Prima? No, there are a lot of rules for Italian universities, for instance. I'm here, one of the oldest universities worldwide, started 2014, Siena University. Yesterday we were talking about public and cultural diplomacy. There is a master's here in Siena. Others, they are talking about science diplomacy in the age of climate change. Imoni, science diplomacy for sustainable development in the Mediterranean. Science diplomacy and increasing role of Italy's cross. So, yes, it's been known and a fact within many of the areas. Where we are sitting now, in San Lacchiera, you have one of the best initiatives, the SDSN Mediterranean, with more than tens of universities in this initiative. And I was talking about this dashboard. Could you imagine the number of red circles? This shows the challenges in this region as regards the climate change and the SDS and the, uh, the sustainable development goals according to the UN. If you saw this report, and I, I wrote, I, I read it with Angelo, uh, Professor Caboni, and it shows how our region really needs this networking of universities to solve this. And I quote Angelo in saying, partnerships are crucial for sustainable development in the Mediterranean region, research and innovation, lead organizations, institutions, and the civil society for the achievement of common goals and proposing solutions to these challenges. And this is the role of universities. This is a major role of universities in defeating this challenge that we are facing in our region. In Egyptian, Universities also, they, are pre they started to understand and aware about science diplomacy and doing workshops. We'll hope that we start also masters and uh, degrees and courses in this regard and having all of the cooperation between the, uh, within universities. One of the important initiatives were between Egypt and Italy. And you could say, yes, it's a visit by the uh, Minister Tajini to Egypt. He was meeting uh, high-level uh, authorities in Egypt, the President, the Prime Minister. But actually, could you imagine the core of this with the Prima projects and how we are going to scale up on these projects and build on these projects. And we are having a lot of missions back and through between Egypt and Italy in this regard. And here comes, this, and this is within the role of universities. And actually yesterday with Professor Kabuni, we had a lot of talks and conference calls with different players to advance this cooperation within the Mediterranean and specifically between Egypt and Italy. And this is a part of the science diplomacy and the role of universities. Allow me for five minutes to tell you what, where I'm coming from and how a very young university, only three years old, could also play a role. It's not only about 1,240 uh, CNA University, but also a young university. Actually, I'm coming from Ain Shams University, where I'm, I'm still a professor there. I'm seconded to Galala, and Ain Shams is around. By the way, Ain Shams is considered one of the oldest 
worldwide. According to the history, we are 3,000 before Christ. Christ. So 3,000 years, not only 1,200. So, uh, and it was called Da'in uh, University and then changed to Ain Shams University. But Galala is one of the very young national universities in Egypt. We are a public university owned by the government, but tuition based, we are inclusive. But in three years, I will, get, I will take you through some of the achievements that a small university played as a role in science diplomacy. We are part of the Race to Zero Climate for Universities, and we were honored to be part of this. We are honored to be part and member of the SDSN with South Kiara, and we are working in a report, and we are one of the focal points here, Galala University. We are part of the Imoni with Professor uh, Zuhairi, and we signed the agreement to be within the Imoni networking. We did some of the conferences about with UNESCO for the open science in the Arab region. We were sharing in the COP27 and showing what we did in the COP27. We worked in the Red Sea Maritime Conference to connect around the Red Sea which, and the logistics around the Red Sea. We proposed how our scientists could uh, interfere and act as act players in CBC Met, Prima Info Days, we had a lot of visits from Arab and African delegations and ambassadors coming and visiting our university. We are offering a lot of scholarships for African uh, students. In less than three years, we have 5,000 students, 14 schools, 47 programs. In less than three years, our professors has around 600 publications and more than 25 projects. So actually, a small university or a young university could really play a role also in science diplomacy. We were one of the first to have an American team lecturing to our students and at the same time a visit from China and the cultural attaché of China and they were meeting in the land of Galala. We are powered by Arizona State University and we're honored to have Michael Crow, the president of Arizona. This means that we're giving dual degrees with Arizona powered by mean that it's a type of cooperation between universities where we are giving dual degrees, they are also our partners, our strategy, our marketing, our faculty development, all of these things also are working together. This is a type, we are part, also part of what's called Centana Alliance and we hope that Siena will be part of this alliance. We have around 100,000 students around the region in this alliance with 15 universities to reach around 50 universities within five, three to four years and around one million students around the world. Japan, we have professors coming from Horishima University teaching with us. Also, we are sending our students to learn. This was a visit to South Africa. Now we have some students in Romania. Others are going to uh, uh, Indonesia. We received students from Nottingham. And here, let me show you, before I finish, two videos about Galala University. This is for tomorrow. How we think, how we learn, experience mistakes, and overcome challenges. Here, opportunities to change tomorrow aren't just in a lab. They're in the place you least expect. We push boundaries, experience innovation, building, problem solving, and solutions that change the world or someone's life. Because when you join us, you become the next generation of thinkers, influencers, innovators, and lifesavers. Galala University, powered by Arizona State University. المصريين انا هوريكوا جامعه مش موجوده انا في مصر عشان الناس اللي بتحلم بالتعليم لا 
احنا مش هنسيب حاجة نقدر نعملها الا ما هنعملها وهنعملها كويس and congratulations also for this uh, very interesting new uh, venture, Galala University. Uh, yesterday when we met uh, Roberto Di Pietra. This is by the way the new university. Is what? This is the university. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, you, you said that uh, basically the city is around the university. Yes. Uh, Roberto yesterday properly said that uh, it's like Siena because Siena you have a city around the university here. You have the same, maybe. Uh, a few hundred years of difference, but uh, the concept is the same. Okay, good. Now, if you have uh, questions or remarks, uh, uh, Mohamed is here. Please. Hi, good morning or good afternoon. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my name is Mira, and with Professor Borghese and Professor Riccaboni, we're working on studying really the cross-border implications of carbon mitigation, um, and specifically in the agriculture sector. So your presentation was particularly interesting for that. Um, but my question is a bit more um, abstracted. You rightly mentioned that, that the uh, enticement of working in terms of science is the objectivity and the rationality. But you also alluded to the role of culture and specificity, and you mentioned institutions that are public institutions. 
and you mentioned the whole nexus between science and foreign policy and diplomacy. Do you see um, and experience tensions where ideology, not as a strict ideology, but where politics do come in? And what is the role of a network like Prima and science diplomacy in navigating that nexus between objectivity in science, but also the fundamental uh, subjectivity of funding, of uh, political priorities we saw it in the pandemic, where cooperation was not necessarily a given. And we're also seeing it now in terms of climate with potential like, green backlashes against climate policies that are being pushed. Um, yeah, have you experienced those tensions? Might you experience them? And how do you navigate them? This is very, a very uh, smart question, a very good question. Thank you so much for asking this question. And I think answering it will need a lot of time. But I will tell you, yes, we see this. And uh, I will not talk now as a president, but I will talk as one of the politicians, uh, as a president of university and as a politician. Yes, I see a lot of these tensions between countries, but sometimes you see that the role of university scientists start to go on and solve these conflicts and could help in solving it. Um, I don't want to mention names, or, but at the same time, I see the opposite where those two universities are going to work together, but you do some political tension, they stop the cooperation, the cooperation is not allowed, let's face it. But in many times, I see how uh, uh, scientists overcome this, and they have their way in order to continue their scientific cooperation. Um, it would be more elaborate if I mentioned some examples, but I don't want to say that. But yes, we saw that. Even we saw that in Prima. Sometimes we are very keen about what is the relations within our countries. We have a graph that shows the connections between who is working with whom and trying to stress uh, on the South-South cooperation, for instance. And this is one of the things we are pushing. So we are doing a lot of workshops, having more of orientation. We did uh, an, uh, a, a seminar or workshop bringing uh, scientists from this country and this country where there are conflicts between the two countries but actually bringing those two in a networking, in a matchmaking event, break the ice and allow those two countries to be a partner and to solve that they are not working together but they can work through Siena University. So the coordinator is here in Italy, and this country and this, that country are working together. So yes, there is a way. There are sometimes it helps and solves problem, but sometimes there are uh, a conflict where unfortunately they couldn't continue, but this is life and how we are trying to uh, go and support this type of If I may add to this very interesting question, that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, first of all, uh, it is extremely important that science is always open. I mean, we need to cooperate always. We are the last, the last resort. If even uh, science does not cooperate, it is over. And uh, we need to keep bridges open. We need to, to work among countries, even if uh, politics say that we shouldn't, uh, or because otherwise it is when even uh, science, even, when even scientists do not talk to each other, really, we are in a very bad situation. So you showed uh, some cases where we have programs where you have uh, countries like Algeria and Morocco, which have very big difficulties to, to talk to each other, but they do it. We have projects where Israel is working with some Arab countries, and you know, it's very difficult to make them talk but in science, they can do it. Even if uh, politics says that you shouldn't do it, or that is very important that they talk to each other. Uh, I would like to show you the map. Uh, we have uh, uh, the map of, uh, of the Mediterranean, and Giovanni can uh, see uh, the problems we have when we have maps, because uh, there are problems with Algeria and uh, Morocco about the borders, because of the uh, West, uh, West uh, um, Sahara borders at uh, Algeria and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Morocco, they would like to say 
and to see their theirs. Now it comes here. No, the other one also. No, this one. You see here. So, uh, of course, uh, Mohamed was very smart. He, he didn't show down because if you go down, you need to make a decision whether the West Sahara is of Algeria or Morocco. So, <laughs> so what we must do? Either we don't put borders, which is even better, or if you put border, you don't go down. Because when we went down, then there was a, a very dangerous tension between the two, because each of them came to us saying, if you keep it, we leave Prima. So if you... to show just the upper part of the map because otherwise you make a decision and you, I mean, as you know, there are big tensions between Morocco and, and so there are many of these things, but science must be open and we need to work to make people talk, otherwise it's a, it's a problem. And we are promoting because we are rather inclusive rather than exclusive. So there are other countries that are showing interest to join Prima and already received their interest and we are trying to see a way to include them within our projects. Uh, was uh, the Cyprus part, northern part. We had a problem with one of the first reports of SDSN together with Cyprus SDSN because we, we dropped uh, a map, we, we, we took a map from the web and it wasn't uh, very uh, attentive to, to the borders. And it was, uh, so they, they highlighted that the, the situation was critical and they did, do not accept it uh, that uh, our draw of the of the border so we we changed it our our map and all we took it off directly uh, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, speech my name is francesco frati i'm a professor of zoology here at the university of siena and i enjoyed very much uh, listening to your uh, great presentation uh, of course, I shared with Angelo and all the community here at the, of the University of Siena the commitment for SDSN, the commitment for Prima, and we are all very proud of what uh, Angelo and his staff have been doing uh, uh, here in Siena to promote this uh, initiative. Uh, my comment uh, <coughs> is, uh, you know, follows uh, her comments uh, on a different plane. Um, in a way, uh, science has always been open. I mean, scientists, uh, you know, back in the old times, they have never really uh, you know, cared too much about uh, borders, uh, about uh, political uh, uh, um, crashes between among countries. Uh, and, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, this is one of the great things of, uh, of uh, science. Um, at the same time, in the last decades, I kind of uh, perceive the fact that uh, uh, as long as we started to uh, classify these initiatives into scientific diplomacy, which is a, you know, a, a, fantastic, a fantastic idea, scientific diplomacy is a fantastic idea, uh, I sort of uh, uh, saw that uh, other kinds of uh, uh, contrasts have been uh, uh, grown and I kind of uh, you know refer to contrast to to what well, we, we recently experienced the Novax uh, initiatives uh, around the world which is very uh, uh, transversal uh, around the world and it's something which is very ideological at the same time, uh, previously we had uh, you know, all the movements uh, against uh, GMOs. Uh, we had uh, uh, movement, and we still have movements against uh, 
uh, um, you know, the, the, the reality of global change, of climate change. So I see around the world, probably also fostered by the diffusion of social media, I kind of see around the world uh, an increasing growing of uh, movements against science in itself, against the legitimization of uh, uh, scientists uh, around the world, and in a way against the scientific method which uh, leads uh, all the um, uh, uh, work, all the, all the efforts of the scientists all over the world, uh, regardless or, or whether they are physicians uh, or zoologists uh, or uh, agrobotanists or whatever they are. So, have you had, uh, the question could be, uh, have you had uh, during your experience with Prima uh, a sense that these movements uh, are growing, that these movements uh, are becoming uh, stronger and they are not uh, 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 supported by politics at all, but they might be supported by ideology, sometimes they might be supported by religion, uh, which I feel as uh, a threat in many cases, in this kind, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, um, you know, landscape. So, have you had any uh, sense that these uh, movements uh, are becoming stronger? Thank you so much, because I always believe we have to face our problems and not to go away and say, no, no, there is no problem, we are going, doing well. Yes, there are some movements, but what we are trying to do, for instance, in Prima, is to involve the public. And always have, beside our annual work plan, we, before uh, going it, Yes, the stakeholders having their say, but also there is what's called the public consultation. But more important, some of our initiatives is to scale up these projects. If I'm a normal person walking the street, why they are taking a lot of money for those scientists just putting this and that and not affecting my life? But actually when he sees that there is a product coming of this scientific research that affects his life and improves his life, and makes his life much more easier, he starts to believe, yes, we have to invest. We cannot blame them only, because sometimes we as scientists or professors, we speak in a, a way and in, 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 in a different level, we thought everybody understands what we are saying. But sometimes they say, what they are saying? We cannot understand what they are saying. So we have to have this type of, of I would say, a uh, way of talking to the public, to, under, to tell them what we are doing. I remember one of the uh, PhD students, he couldn't write his conclusion. So his professor told him, go downstairs to the doorman and tell him what you are doing in three minutes and explain to him what's your PhD about and then get back to your apartment. He went downstairs. He got the dolmen, he explained to him what he's doing, he gets upstairs, he finishes the conclusion. And this is a real, a real story. This is the way how we can facilitate things. But yes, there are movements, but we have to think how we can make it much more easier to explain. But rather than explanation, is to have a real product and a real effect on the communities. And I think this was counterpart during the COVID. Without the vaccination that we have, without the rules that the physicians and nurses did, that's the scientific concept we didn't have faced this. Although there were people that say, this is what they are doing is nothing, we cannot follow them. But I totally agree with you, but we have to think about it. Andrew, do you have to say this? Is there any younger researcher before the Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm, my name is Jamal. Uh, first year of uh, public and cultural diplomacy. I'm very uh, well 
felt very uh, uh, happy about your presentation. Thank you, because I felt yeah. you were very happy uh, no. <laughs> no, no, I was, I was, I was very uh, uh, happy. Uh, the, I just want to stress on uh, uh, two concepts you've mentioned earlier. It's about science in diplomacy and science for diplomacy. And uh, uh, even though both terms may might highly uh, overlap. But I want to bring here like concrete examples, uh, since, of course, your work is not only about innovation, cooperation, but also uh, an attempt to mitigate uh, existential or persistent challenges within the Mediterranean area. Uh, what actually brings me to this is a, a, a recent piece I read on Crisis Group. It's about the uh, gas diplomacy in the East Mediterranean. So, from my point of view, I, this might be a challenging as a, uh, a, well, a research point, so to speak, but the point is how easy for universities institutions like Prima to go and bring actual insightful, I don't know, maybe we can say uh, objective outcomes from such persistent conflict in the Mediterranean. Uh, I mean, apart from other huge, big challenges regarding the uh, demarcations, uh, I don't know, the, uh, the sea laws, etc. I mean, we have huge problems in the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, Egypt and Greece, uh, Cyprus, uh, Spain, Morocco on one hand, uh, Libya, Egypt recently as well. So, to put it quite uh, clearly is, is, I mean, how much is easy to, to uh, to tackle these issues without uh, uh, being so uh, uh, reflective to states' diplomacy. So in research diplomacy or scientific diplomacy, you're not devising a policy by itself. You're more or less, uh, and as, as far as I understand, you are also a member board of the Egyptian Ministry of Education and Research. So, how you can mitigate a both between state actor diplomacy and non-state actor diplomacy to mitigate such problems like uh, uh, the Mediterranean issues here. Yeah. I you. hope I was clear. <laughs> Uh, a little bit Turkey was a little bit upset of that, but now you'll find that a lot of Egyptian universities working with Turkish universities, and now the Egyptian ambassador is back to Turkey, the Turkish ambassador is back to Cairo, so things are moving. For us as a scientist, as a prima, what we see is our, are the challenges within our region. We are not adapting our annual work plan according to the politics, but according to the real challenges. And once the scientists, as Angelo mentioned, once the scientists see that this is a challenge within my country, within my region, they dedicate their science to solve it. I'm a surgeon by practice. Whatever the patient in front of me, I will treat him. I don't look to his sanity, to his religion, to his nationality, to whatever. And exactly the scientists do the same. Once I have a challenge, I solve this challenge. Whatever this challenge is, it's in a country that's blah, 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 but this is how the concept of science diplomacy, at, but at the same time, sometimes you need to play some politics to facilitate things, to move around it. So this is exactly what are we doing in Prima. Although, there, as I told you, there was a little bit of tension between Egypt and Turkey, but since 2018, there were Egyptian universities working with Turkish universities, and now everything is back to norm, and everything is going on the right direction. Uh, too young before the ah, former young. Who was? There was another somebody raised a hand. No, no, still there. No, no wrong. Okay, so now the former young. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. My name is Massimiliano Montini. I'm professor of European Union law here in, in Siena. 
Uh, I, you mentioned in your presentation when we, you were talking about the features of Prima, you mentioned the creation of the critical mass. This is a particularly interesting point for me because I see that, particularly in social sciences, the first step is to create the diplomacy, create the relationship between the two sides of the Mediterranean. The next step would be the co-creation of research and knowledge. And this is a point that not always works so smoothly. So what, what is your vision about Prima in particular, about, and about the cooperation the Mediterranean you are experiencing? Is there, what is the potential for, for this, for this, this second step, the co-creation of knowledge? Because we, are, we also have to consider that Europe and the Euro-Mediterranean area in general might become marginal in economic terms, in a global perspective. So actually, if we co-create, knowledge and research, we have an higher potential in a globalized world. So what is your vision? What, how can Prima contribute? Or how is Prima already contributing to that? Scaling up. Scaling up approaches. I think Angelo agrees with me, because this is one of the things we started. I'll tell you something apart from this, but I will tell you something very similar to what you're saying. When we started Prima, we as South Mediterranean countries were very afraid of the innovation action projects or the higher technology readiness level projects. All the South Mediterranean countries coming to me and Angelo, we don't have the capacity to uh, participate in these uh, uh, innovation action projects. Uh, we don't have the scientists. We ha don't have the knowledge. Uh, let's go towards the research innovation action. Let's go towards a lower TRL. But for, for youngsters, because maybe you don't know what is TRL. You know what is TRL? Okay, maybe it's better to say a few words about it. I'm sorry. This is exactly, I'm saying what I would just, because we are saying some words that by default, I think everybody understands, but technology readiness level, when you're doing a research and getting a product, it's from one to nine. Once you reach from six to nine, this means that the product of your project is more ready to be transferred to the market. So one to four is basic science. Four to six, we always say, this is the death valley. Are you going to pass this death valley to be from six to nine? So your project, your um, uh, science, hypo scientific hypothesis is more ready for transferring into the industry, into the community, into the market. So our countries were more towards the basic science, afraid of what we call higher TRL or technology readiness level or innovation action, not only a research, not only, and my biologist will be very angry from me, putting this thing on this thing and getting this, pro this reaction, but so what's the product? I always, as a surgeon, I always sit with the biologist, they will tell me, I, we need this and that, and my answer always, what is the effect of what you are doing on my patient? So this is higher TRL. He's doing a lot of thin things under the microscope, but so what? How this is going to affect? So getting back to you, so actually we started to push them, and it ends up that the South Mediterranean countries' performance in higher TRL or technology readiness level projects was much more better than their, if their performance in other projects with lower TRL. So this was one of the ways that we bridge it and we change the mind. And now what we are, what I'm stressing on is the scaling up of the projects. We got very good projects and then we got this product. So what? We published and then. So scaling up, taking this product and making it available for the community and seeing a product. Before we always say publish or vanish. But what we say now is publish innovate or vanish. I hope I answered your question in a way. Another from a younger, young person. <laughs> younger and younger. Younger, younger. Well, I used to quote oh, oh, many times Bob Dylan when he said, I'm much younger now. And thanks to these guys, I, I feel to be much younger. And this is part of my question, actually, or bit probably not a question but a comment. Uh, uh, the question was about the criticalities and I think uh, already touched by 
the comments by Francesco and so on. Uh, of course, I, I agree uh, with the uh, objective, and I think that uh, Prima is a success story which, in a way, uh, can show uh, us that uh, another uh, scientific diplomacy is possible. But of course, so we, we face problems. Some of the problems already touched, I don't want to repeat. I just want to, to stress two things. One is, uh, the more uh, we, we get into this, uh, uh, and, and we, we discover that uh, it's a necessary uh, way of conceiving our job and our daily work, uh, the more we discover that we are so weak. And the Mediterranean area is a case in point. Uh, your figures are, are clear. We don't know each other still, nevertheless, our history. Uh, I personally leave uh, this, this thing with a bit of uh, uh, embarrassment because uh, I myself, I was completely neglecting Mediterranean politics. I'm a political scientist and uh, I approached this, uh, let's say, when I was uh, getting older, let's say. Um, but this, in part, is, is due to the fact that the system was forcing us, for instance, to study on the European democracies or European politics or European societies and so on. Uh, the second aspect is the nature, the endogamic nature of, uh, of our um, system, which is a fact. Before I was, I was uh, using the expression community of learners because uh, in the, in the uh, idea we have, uh, Andrew was touching the um, metaphor of the city campus, which is somehow uh, the same even in a very different uh, uh, historical, let's say, uh, uh, adventures like uh, our, our uh, universities. Um, learners are everybody, from the citizen who's helping to the student who's actually in the old uh, studio uh, was the the, the, per, the key person in selecting professors, then of course things have changed, but we still have a, a democratic uh, system like that, uh, to the professors who are not different. They are learners as, as the others, but they are forming specific sub-communities because they have to use a specific language, a scientific language, which are called epistemic communities. Now, uh, the the, the situation in, in the Mediterranean is that we have a very strong uh, epistemic community, but very weak learners' community. And actually, I again, quote Francesco when he says that uh, we need to, uh, to make this effort to talk each other. Uh, you, you mentioned already a number of strategies. And, and again, Prima is a, is a perfect example that this can be, can be done. But I think in a larger scale, uh, we need the more ambitious and probably we need also to ask more resources. Mobility. Mobility across Mediterranean is ridiculous. International crisis mobility is ridiculous. Uh, neighbor uh, programs, uh, neighbor countries programs is just zero point something. Uh, second point, uh, uh, and this is for us, uh, how to represent the learners community. We don't have to, to, to go to this international forum saying uh, uh, I represent the, the economists or the political scientists or, or the, or the uh, sergeants or, or, or the biologists. We need to represent a, a vision. In order to do that, we have, we have to start exchange with these young people the idea of civic engagement or public engagement. Everybody talks about that, but in the end, we don't really practice public engagement. So we need to, to share uh, methods and experience of public engagement. And this is also not very costly because we can do by mobility, but we can do by virtual mobility. And third and last and probably more, more uh, most uh, uh, ambitious, we need to um, rescale a little bit our social, our self-perception. I used to say that we need more Aeneas uh, heroes than Achilles heroes. We need the Pietas and not the Ubers. We need traveler, traveling people, maybe traveling by train or in economy in order to reduce costs and, 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 and pollution. But we need to keep going like that and to, to go together as students. 
this is not yet completely shared and understood, even in Siena, even in, in our university. Thanks. Thank you so much, and I totally again support what you're saying, sir. And by the way, we have a lot of tools we are not using. For instance, those youngers are always on the social media, and they believe in, we were talking about the, before the lecture, about the, the followers and the number of influencers. None of the influencers are scientists. But we have to see how they are thinking, how what are the um, platforms they are using, and go there and see how the way and presenting the the ideas and the effect of the science on their lives. Another former young, he thinks he's young, but he's not that young. Please, not form. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I would like to, um, to ask your opinion, not only your opinion, but the opinion of the uh, vice-rectors vice and uh, former rectors that are here in this room about the, the idea of uh, Romano Prodi, uh, former president of the European Commission and former uh, president of the Italian uh, Council of Ministers, about the creation of Mediterranean universities. His idea is about creating 2030, around 2030, big Mediterranean universities, trying to, to share, starting from the present universities, trying to share uh, um, ideas, cultures, and to mix, uh, of course, uh, all the uh, scientific-based uh, um, uh, potentiality of the scientific community of the Mediterranean. What do you all think about this and what uh, is needed for uh, transforming this idea into practice in the coming years? Because, of course, you are in, in, in your role, you are professors, of course, but you are also policy, university policy makers. So, uh, 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 the last point, they answered, uh, money is not allowed uh, to you. <laughs> what is needed? Money, no, not allowed, this answer. <laughs> point that I was going to talk about because if you if you look at our region the Euro Mediterranean we are the only region that's not having this same uh, I would say rules for universities around the Mediterranean the start we started in 1972 but we didn't continue we were going as Euro Mediterranean universities to accredit all universities according to a same accreditation so that all our degrees are accredited within our region. We signed already as countries a document in 1972, but since then, 51 years, we didn't move forward a step. Imagine that all universities, 1,000 universities around the Mediterranean, they started to have the same accreditation with the same approval of degrees around the Mediterranean Imagine the amount of mobility that we will allow. You could imagine, for instance, Portugal never allowed a university out of Portugal. The first time they allowed a branch campus out of Portugal was in Egypt after three years of negotiation. I was honored to have this, and we have now Nova University in Cairo. The first Portuguese university outside of Portugal was in Egypt. So I totally agree about this idea. This is very needed. We talked a lot through the Union for Mediterranean that we need to align our policies, our quality assurance, our accreditation system within the Mediterranean. We have, as I showed you in the numbers, around 1,000 universities. Those universities, if they started to see the same vision, working together, accrediting each other, as what's happening worldwide. Only our region lacks this. I think this will be a step forward for scientific cooperation within our region, and I think the professors We'll have also uh, a view on this year. Just want to remind that uh, Romano Prodi was uh, 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 in Siena a few weeks ago presenting this idea, and we had also discussion. For instance, it, my my comment was that uh, uh, we could start uh, from bilateral uh, cooperation if we don't have money for this big uh, uh, thing, and he was agreeing. The, the answer was basically you need to be a bit uh, uh, to bring a bit of utopia in order to to, to, to make a revolutionary change, and I fully agree with the, with Sio uh, Romano on this. Um, 
Uh, oh, no. No, no, sorry, because there is a... We were talking about that you know, having like a, a one university. Yeah, I mean, uh, my, my idea, my, my, my idea on this uh, subject is that uh, while uh, we always have to watch with great satisfaction the creation of new education institutions, new universities, Galala University is pretty young and uh, very successful. But at the same time, my question, my, my, the question I ask myself is, uh, do we need uh, to create additional uh, institutions uh, uh, that uh, are created from the very beginning as being transnational or rather should we support the collaboration within existing universities uh, we have many uh, examples i believe uh, for example in europe uh, through the erasmus programs of uh, how universities can collaborate and certainly we can do much better, the European alliances uh, that are being uh, uh, that have been launched uh, a few years ago are another example of uh, cooperation on specific subjects. I also I am also very critical about uh, uh, let's say uh, countries uh, who, which are establishing. Uh, universities in other countries the, my question is what you, you made an example uh, an, exam, uh, an example of portugal what is the need for portugal to create a new university where in cairo what is the need for american universities to have their campuses uh, in rome in florence now now, in this time, probably it was necessary 50 years ago because uh, I believe it was a way for those universities to provide uh, internationalization opportunities uh, for their students. But now, in 2023, what is the need uh, for a university from any given country in the world uh, to establish its brand uh, in another country? Wouldn't it be better for that university to establish a solid relationship uh, with one existing university in that country? Now, the only answer to this question that, uh, you know, let me uh, think that uh, it might be good uh, is the fact that uh, you create a new, uh, uh, a new mm, mm, educational institution and this uh, going back to my, to my uh, premise, is always a good thing. But really, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see the need uh, for Italy to establish a branch, one, for, for the University of Siena to establish its own branch in uh, Algeria. Rather, I, would, I, I think it would be much better if we build a solid relationship, uh, joint courses, for example, uh, exchange programs of teachers and students uh, with any of the existing university in the other country. That's my, my view. Thank you. I, that was really interesting. I agree. Um, if I may, I think that there are perhaps two different dynamics. I think we have one dynamic of the prospect of establishing Mediterranean universities. And I agree there that to establish collaboration would, could be more effective than establishing new institutions. And I think that the dynamic, the really interesting one that you mentioned of, of these branches kind of dropped into other places, I think that comes down 
even though even there I agree that it would be better to create the collaboration between, between existing institutions, I think we have a commodification of education where the interest in creating that branch somewhere else is not um, down to the efficacy of it, but it's down to the image of it. And so the university in the United States that creates their branch in Rome gets to, as a multinational, can set up a, a base somewhere else, gets to project the reach of their university and, and expand their image. Um, and it comes down perhaps even to the whole theory of diplomacy of moving away from a projection of your national image to a long-term, slower diplomatic relationship. And I think that that's that parallel that we might want to shift away from, a projection of who you are as a university versus your willingness to create scientific diplomacy in the long run and that partnership, and maybe two different systems. my voice uh, I'm on the young inside <laughs> um, to say that I agree with Francesco on the fact that probably there is no need to create branches all around which is a trend that I observe and we need to reinforce what we already have in theory but we never really implement it going back to Uncle Romano <laughs> proposal um, I think that an utopian proposal is what we need to, to go forward. I don't think we need actually tons of Mediterranean universities. I would rather go for a flagship Mediterranean university. And I'm thinking here of my own experience uh, at the European University Institute, which is a flagship, basically, European university uh, that created that paved the way towards more collaboration, but was a truly uh, prototype for what has happened later. So I think it would be to have one or two Mediterranean universities that are Mediterranean from scratch, and this would pave the way to more collaborations. And that's also the idea that I have in mind that I'd like to discuss later. It's basically having something Mediterranean in some context that can pave the way to be more inclusive uh, and then create bilateral agreements. So both ways probably work. Yeah, do we have something to the conversation? No. Over the lunch? Okay, okay, good. So is, is there any other remark or question? So Otherwise, we go toward the conclusion. <clears throat> Just a few remarks, because maybe, especially for youngsters, to highlight uh, uh, the three meanings of uh, science diplomacy, making some examples, because without examples, it's more difficult. Informing foreign policy objectives with scientific advice, I would say informing policy in general, not only foreign policy, uh, science which is uh, using, uh, oh, sorry, which is supporting diplomacy, a uh, good example is now, uh, you know that the European Commission has a, has a body made of scientists who are advising the, the policy makers to do their policies. And for instance, now in the last few days, there was a new document on uh, towards uh, sustainable food consumption. Maybe you, you have heard of it. You, for those who are interested in food, uh, that is a very important document towards sustainable food consumption. And that was made by uh, many, many, by these people, this is a committee, and this is an example because uh, that will be also the basis for food diplomacy and uh, diplomacy based also on food. So that is a good example of scientists defining the lines which will be useful for diplomacy. The other one, facilitating international science cooperation, for instance, uh, uh, it means that uh, you want to uh, facilitate the relationship among scientists. Because Francesco said that there has always been uh, relationships, but without support, that is very difficult. Because uh, maybe not everybody knows which is the real problem in the Mediterranean in terms of uh, scientific uh, 
the Thomas Scientific Cooperation, the real problem is not the North-South uh, cooperation, the real problem is the South-South cooperation, but also in terms of economic, also in economic terms, the problem is that the amount of a trade South-South is very small, which, which is very, very, very risky for everybody, it's very bad. So, uh, if you don't have channels, you don't have a scientist work among them, because I mean, you need money, you need uh, uh, common laboratories, you, you need projects. So the diplomacy for science. And then science for diplomacy is when you uh, use uh, uh, projects also to help to make relationships. And Prima, of course, is uh, mainly the second and the third uh, part, because, of course, we facilitate relationships, but also what is very important now, and this uh, allows me to say words about the future of Prima, is that uh, uh, we are already helping relationships, but we would like to do more, and this is the reason why of these missions uh, that uh, Mohamed mentioned before, missions by the Italian government in other med countries like uh, Egypt, but also Albania, but also Tunisia, in order to use food diplomacy and uh, science diplomacy on food to make better links, better relationships about countries. And of course, in order to do that, not only you need to sell quotes research, but also the implementation research within communities and uh, enterprises, which is the bi big and difficult task in front of us. Because of course, if you want to use uh, science for diplomacy, you need also to show that science is useful for people the European level now, they are discussing not only of science diplomacy, but the, the latest fashion is innovation diplomacy. They talk about innovation diplomacy. As here at the COP27, the pavilion of, of Europe was about innovation diplomacy. So this is what uh, also we are trying to do. So this is for the future. This opens me the, 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 the gate for, to talk about briefly about the future. So as Mohamed said, we were funded for seven years, 24 will be the last call, and then what? Uh, so we were working hard in order to, to work with the Commission for the future. At the end, the, the agreement is that for three more years, we will have a bridge funding for three more years, the same agenda that we had before. So for three more years, we will have the same topics efficient use of water, uh, sustainable agriculture, and uh, food value chains. So this is just for three years, and we call it Prima 2. But now, and we will arrive to 27. Then we, we have to talk about the next European framework, uh, which is uh, between uh, f the European framework program, which will be 27 34. And that will be Prima 3. So in the next few years, we will have Prima 2, the continuation, and meanwhile, starting January 24, we will discuss about what we will do in Prima 3. So maybe also discussions like this will help us to define the Prima 3 initiative. As Mohamed was saying, governments now see more and more important translation of innovation within companies and, uh, and uh, communities. So what we think about is uh, how to make it, how to make the results of our projects used by companies, food companies, farmers, and communities. So probably this could be the, the, the target, or maybe also to enlarge a little bit the scope out of uh, food systems, also towards uh, energy, uh, renewable energy, and it could be also some health related to nutrition. So we will see what happens, but if you have ideas, we would be very pleased to share. Uh, if I may, just the last point about uh, the European, the European, uh, sorry, the Mediterranean uh, University. <coughs> so, in my opinion, it is clear why <coughs> countries establish universities in other countries. Very often, it's just for soft power. It's for, for, I mean, in order to influence the new, the new uh, and higher uh, generations and, and, and the, 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 the youth, and to to be sure that the values of country which is opening the, the, the new university are coherent with, the, with, the, with the, the leading class coming from those universities. So the, the, there's a, an issue of, of soft power. 
which should be highlighted. So I think that the, 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 the proposal of a Mediterranean university should be first referred to the issue of a, which is the vision, which is the strategy. I mean, the answer depends on, on the vision. What we want to do next? I mean, we don't need a, a university or even more uh, money or, or, or tools given to existing universities. We need to have a vision. What is lacking is a vision, which is the strategy. We should define the strategy and then we find a solution. Europe, I mean, as we know, lack of clear leadership and clear vision. I mean, what we want to do next? Because, uh, I mean, it doesn't make any sense that in order to promote Prima, we need to work so hard while everybody knows that it's the right thing to do, to make bridges with, uh, with Africa. Everybody knows. I mean, Africa is the future for Europe, for the world. So it's clear that these kind of projects, not, not because we are involved, but these projects are what we need to do. We need to do 10 primas in 10 fields, not only in agri food. But Europe is difficult to, very slow, it's difficult to go in this direction. So we need a vision. What do we want to do in 10 years, in 20 years? Do we want to, in, we, do we want to be integrated with Africa? The answer should be, should be yes. And our politicians should decide that we need to be more integrated. And then the, the answer is we put money, because without money you don't, you don't do anything. And then we can, work in, we can work on the existing universities. We can create new universities. I mean, there are many options. But first we have to have more clear ideas of what Europe would like to be in 10 years, in 20 years. Otherwise, there are just short-term solutions, and we don't need short-term solutions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Roman, for being here. And now you can also ask questions to Mohamed over lunch. We have a lunch here. You are all invited. So thanks for being with us today. Thank you.